<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Professor John V. Osmond for the Purdue University Oral History Program. He took place on March the 26, 2008 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born in 1918, so you know how old I am now. And uh, I was born in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is a college town. I grew up in a college environment. My dad was a professor at uh, uh, Massachusetts State College, now UMass. And he was a botanist, and as a consequence, I was exposed to the outside, to nature at an early age, and he encouraged me to keep my eyes open, and uh, from that I became an entomologist. Okay. What was, um, did you go to school there, and, uh, and your high school, what was high school? Oh, like? I went to Amherst High School, Okay. and from there I went one year uh, what now they call it a gap year. In those days, it was uh, a year between high school and college. I went to Deerfield Academy, uh, which was nearby, and then entered the University of Massachusetts in 1936. Okay. Did, Had a wonderful career in college. Tell us a little bit about what was the campus like in those days. Well, Did the you live on campus? Part of the time I lived on campus, part of the time I lived in town. Uh, because finances were slim in those days. It was the, the height of the Depression. And uh, the college, it was a small college. I think the enrollment of students at the time was someone over 1,000, maybe 1,500 people. Uh, actually, before I graduated, I probably knew almost everybody in college. And uh, it was just a wonderful place. Uh, my interests outside of Entomology, which I in which I majored, uh, my interests were in music, and uh, we had a very active leader for vocal music there. Established a very fine glee club in my junior senior year, and uh, uh, we formed a quartet called the uh, the Statesman. And it was the first quartet ever formed on the college, and we performed all over New England. So my early life was directed very much towards music, and I honestly at one time thought I might head in that direction. But really my talents in music were limited only to voice. I couldn't play the piano. And uh, so I, I drifted away from that when I decided to go to grad school. Went to Amherst College for grad school. Uh, majored in uh, uh, biology, of course, and did some work in genetics. And then um, Uncle Sam intervened, and uh, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, you know, the military years for most people were not exactly ideal. Uh, the mil military years for me uh, shaped my life, actually. I had the opportunity to go to Camp Gordon, Georgia, as a civilian. I, in fact, I left grad school early. I uh, went down there as, as an entomologist on the post, uh, set up programs in mosquito control uh, because of malaria, yellow fever, and the like, <clears throat> and lived in uh, Augusta, Georgia, for a couple of years. Then I got my commission, commissioned right back into the same job I had on the post as a civilian, but that didn't last very long, and they transferred me to Governor's Island, New York, uh, where I thought I was going to be shipped overseas. Instead, I stayed three years in, at Governor's Island as chief entomologist for New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and then later the New England states, and my job was to set up uh, insect control programs uh, uh, at the post throughout those states. Uh, that, that was a, a wonderful experience. I would imagine, right. Uh, what were the times like when you were, I mean, what was the, uh, was it being the military during World War II? Uh, being well, a well, to me, you see, it was, it was a plus. Right. Uh, I didn't, uh, the closest I came to shipping out was that every day I took the ferry boat to Governor's Island. So I tell people I went overseas uh, rather frequently. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> I use my words to their succinct meaning. That's right. <laughs> um, well, life at that time uh, 
was almost like civilian life sure. for many of us who were in, in the headquarters at uh, Governor's Island. It involved a lot of travel. Did you have to do quite a bit of travel? Uh, constantly. Okay. And I had my own Jeep and uh, rigged it up to apply fogging insects in, in, in thermal aerosol fogs. Uh, so it was a good experience. Okay. And I got to know people who <clears throat> in the uh, business world because of that. We used to contract out uh, insect control and rodent control uh, projects at some of the posts, and we would contract out to the civilian area, which most people call pest control. Uh, and uh, I got to know key people in the pest control industry, which in, in a sense led to my coming to Purdue. Right. Okay. Good. You made some good contacts. A very interesting ones, really. When I left the military in 1946, uh, I went to work for Merck Pharmaceutical Company in Rahway, New Jersey, uh, as an entomologist in their research lab. And also, I was uh, really the I represented the <coughs> that part of the Merck uh, research development. Went around and visited universities and places uh, to develop cooperative research programs between Merck and the universities. Uh, and then after I'd been there just about a year, I got a telephone call from a fellow who I had known when I was in the military by the name of William Bettner, B-U-E-T-T-N-E-R. He was executive secretary for the National Pest Control Association, and he and I had had considerable dealings in, during the military. And he said, uh, what do you know about Purdue University? And I said, I know that it was a very fine, it's a very fine university. I, I, uh, I don't know that I've ever met the head of the department, but I knew his name was J.J. Davis. Uh, and I knew that they had some interest in uh, urban entomology. So uh, he said, well, uh, you think you like, might like to go there? And I said, what are the, what's the opportunity? And he told me that the university had decided, or the School of Agriculture had decided, to establish a uh, special program in entomology called uh, Urban Pest Control. So it was really urban entomology. Uh, there were no courses in it, and I was, the opportunity would be to come to Purdue and develop the entire new curriculum. Um, so I uh, decided to look into it. It sounded good to me. And it would get me back into the academic environment in which I grew up to begin with. And I thought maybe this is the opportunity that I've been looking for. I came to interview at uh, Purdue in December of 1947. And that was an unusual interview. J.J. Uh, Davis was the head of the department and we had corresponded ahead of time. Uh, but the interview was scarcely, seem, seemingly, was scarcely like an interview. Uh, I was taken around town, uh, introduced to a, uh, a judge, uh, Judge Parkinson. Uh, I was taken to meet an attorney, uh, my future dentist, all of whom happened to be belong to the fraternity of Kappa Sigma, and I was at Kappa Sigma in college. And... Uh, a very interesting thing happened during that interview. Well, several things happened that were interesting, but particularly, um, I was staying at the Union, went downstairs to the cafeteria for supper, <clears throat> and as I came back up the stairs, I could hear the singing down the hall. It sounded like a glee club to me. So I followed the singing down into the North Ballroom, and there in the North Ballroom was Al Stewart with the glee club, in an informal gathering that was not a formal concert, but they were all gathered in there, singing, having a great time in there. And I stayed for an hour and a half listening to them. I thought, if this university has a glee club like that uh, and everything else is good, I'm coming. So uh, it turns out I got to know Al Stewart. We became, we became very close friends before time passed. Sure. Were you married at this time, sir? I was married at the time. Okay. We lived in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Okay. And uh, my wife, uh, I had known her back in Amherst, Massachusetts. And uh, 
So she was very enthusiastic about the idea also. Okay. Uh, and did you, get a, did you get an offer then, so you decided to come? Oh, I, I got an offer before I left that day. And <clears throat> actually we uh, worked out the arrangements of uh, how Purdue could help pay for my move and so forth, which wasn't done in those days. But they arranged to do part of it for me. So we arrived uh, uh, on a rainy, uncomfortable March 10th, 1948. Um, before we left New Jersey, um, Bill Fledemeyer, who was in charge of housing at the time, uh, sent us a picture of a faculty house that he, uh, they were, had earmarked for me to occupy, which I did not see when I was here for interview. And the house turned out to be what it was one of the so-called black and white houses. And uh, the black and white houses were remarkable in so many different ways. First of all, they were uh, car they were kind of tar paper cardboard shacks, uh, twenty by twenty in size and about twenty feet high, and uh, with the downstairs and upstairs and uh, very primitive. There were one hundred and twenty two of them, I believe, at the time, stretched along uh, State Street in uh, courts, Court A, Court B, etc. We were in Court A. And the house that was assigned to us was the last house available. And when we arrived, it turns out that <clears throat> uh, it was what I always call one block lower. It wasn't one brick higher, it was one block lower. And the reason, uh, it was apparently a, a slightly depressed spot, and the water had run through the, f the first floor of the house and then flooded it. So we couldn't move in. And uh, uh, we expected something different because, as I said, Bill Fleetmeyer sent us a picture of this proposed house, and it had a nice boxwood uh, hedge along the outside of it. My wife was highly impressed with it. Uh, when we arrived on that rainy day, it looked pretty gloomy. Um, so they put us up in the union building for two weeks while they raised the building, dried it out, put a new floor in, and, you know, those ho those houses were put together with uh, Elpson board, which is kind of a paper product. Uh, they were insulated with a little, uh, uh, well, just little insulation in the side, about an inch and a half thick. And um, uh, it was very adequate, as it turns out. It was well designed, and there, there's just a whole colony of us around the semicircle, and many of those friends became lifelong friends. Uh, we just mingle all the time, back and forth between the houses, and uh, uh, we had just a wonderful a time for two years. Yeah, very good. That's nice. So um, that got us started on the right foot. Um, I, I have to tell you one story about the about those houses. Um, after we, we we had a, da a little daughter at that time. She was just going on two year two years old when we moved in, and uh, <clears throat> the question was: All these kids, there were kids everywhere. Uh, what do we do with them? How do we keep them occupied? So some of us got together and we formed what became known as the Associated Parents Nursery School, and. Uh, one of our neighbors was a fellow by the name of Dr. Einer Ryden, who was in education. Uh, so there, half a dozen, a dozen of us got together and, and put this nursery school together. And it, uh, it ended up uh, being in a, uh, one of the housing buildings, which was, uh, wasn't really fit to live in, but it was okay to, uh, to have a nursery school. And uh, one of the first things that happened was that we had to arrange for, oh, some kind of snacks for the little kids. Uh, so we decided on cookies and so forth. Smitty's, the fellow by the name of Smitty, 
uh, was just starting a grocery store on down the street, which uh, uh, got to be known as Smitty's Store. And there were a couple of them eventually in West Lafayette. And Smitty was a great fellow, and he was an entrepreneur. And uh, we went to him and said, well, we, we wanted to have a supply of cookies for these kids. So he arranged for it to be shipped from some warehouse somewhere to the nursery school. And the address on it was uh, Associated Parents Nursery School, Fertile Valley, West Lafayette, Indiana. <laughs> and it was. It's <laughs> a good story. Yeah. Um, uh, another story with respect to the, the black and whites, because they, they became such a tradition around here. Um, at the time, uh, I was in the Department of Entomology, and my research had to do with the thermal aerosol application of uh, pesticides, which basically was simply dispersing uh, insecticides in a fog. Uh, not, it was a mist, but it was more of a fog, and it was called fogging at the time. And we rigged up an old car with a fogging device on the back of it. And we would go down State Street with this fogger. And the people had a choice. They could either close their windows or open their windows. It was about 50-50. Some people thought, well, if we let the fog in, if we've got bugs in the house, it'll kill the bugs. And the kids came out and they played in this fog as we went down the street. And the interesting thing was the active ingredient in that application was DDT, which today people look back on with fear and trembling. At the time, it was one of the most important scientific discoveries of its age. And nobody feared it, nobody cared, nobody worried about it. And uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting... It is a nice, interesting point, right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, now you started in the department. Tell us a little bit about what some of the things that you did in the department. And uh, Well, I started out. Yeah. <clears throat> my job was to develop right. six new courses. And uh, I had the summer to do that, the, the spring and the summer to do that. And that's a lot of courses from scratch because nobody had ever taught them before. And, uh, it was a brand new program. Brand new program. And the only one in the country, so there was no precedent for it. Uh, it was a major challenge and a wonderful challenge, really. Uh, by fall, I had at least the outlines for the courses in mind, and I met my first class in September of uh, 1948. And uh, those young men, there were only six of them in the class, uh, they became lifelong friends, as it turns out. I think in the early days, they probably taught me as much as I taught them. That's okay. Uh, That's I was okay. very... I, I, either fortunately or unfortunately, I was quite young appearing at the time, and so uh, it, it was a question whether they were students or I was a student. And uh, uh, we got those courses off the ground. Uh, they all had to do with urban entomology, that is, the insects that are found in and about households, uh, structures in general, hospitals, warehouses. Uh, whatever, and uh, the... Uh, Did you have any assistance? Did you have a TA? Did you have somebody to help you? Oh, no. Oh. And you well, had Not only that, but I also had to teach the laboratories for some of the ongoing courses in the Department of Entomology. I taught the lab for Entomology 100. Wow. Which was, and those were always big classes. Those were big classes. And... Uh, uh, it, it was a fairly brutal experience, but I, I uh, didn't object to it. It was a challenge. My health held out, and uh, my wife was very tolerant, uh, in fact, very helpful at times. So, uh, How many was, people in the department at that time? Uh, there were eight of us in the department okay. at that time. Okay. Uh, so I taught that. Uh, I went through a two-year cycle and then started another two-year cycle. And by that time, uh, I'd been here uh, long enough to uh, warrant a uh, uh, a year off if I wanted to take it to 
Um, and it, see, I came here as an assistant professor without a PhD, uh, and it, it became evident to me that uh, if I was going to go anywhere in academia that I had to have a PhD. Um, so I, I took uh, time off, and uh, they were very good to me, and they let me go to University of Illinois. I had a Danforth scholarship. and uh, Those so, were pretty good, though, so I've heard of those, Danford. Oh, it was wonderful. I was very fortunate. Uh, so we moved to Urban, uh, Urbana, Illinois, for, and I was there a year and a half, and uh, then came back as uh, surprising... Uh, I came back from there as uh, department head of entomology. Uh, there's a story. Do you want the story that goes with it? Please. <laughs> that enriches things. <laughs> well, it was amazing, really. Um, my intent in going to the University of Illinois, besides getting my Ph.D., was to get additional background to help me in my urban entomology activities when I returned to Purdue and working with the uh, pest control industry throughout the United States. So I majored in entomology at Illinois and minored in business. Very strange combination, but one that I thought would prepare me uh, for what I was expected to do. However, in the spring of the year, um, in May as a matter of fact, um, of 1956. Um, at supper time, I got a phone call. The phone call was from one of my colleagues at Purdue, Glenn Laker, who was a very close friend uh, on the entomology staff. And he called once in a while just to chat anyway. And uh, he started off by saying, uh, Well, how are you doing tonight, boss? And I said, Well, you talk about this boss business. He says, You don't know? I said, I don't know what. He said, you're our new department head. I had never been interviewed. I knew no th nothing of the fact that this might happen. But Harry Reid, who was dean of the Ag School at that time, had his own way of doing things. And he had decided that I was going to be the next department head, even though I didn't know it. Oh, my Lord. And he had appeared in front of the the faculty of the Department of Entomology and told them that I was going to be, but he forgot to let me know. So I scrambled around and finished my degree. On my final, I took my final exam one day at Illinois. The next morning I was department head at Purdue University. That's uncanny. Wow. <laughs> it was. Oh. Absolutely. Don't, we don't do things that way nowadays. Uh, but in those days, uh, the dean of the school and uh, other parts of the administration uh, made up their own minds how things were going to happen. And, uh, and made it happen. And they made it happen. And uh, they provided me what, with what I needed in terms of finances and space. And uh, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better situation. Mm. And fortunately, the faculty, who thought I was just the kid on the faculty, uh, had to kind of swallow pretty hard uh, this, because I was uh, about, uh, I was pretty young at that time, and uh, I guess I was 42, something like that. Right. No, I wasn't that. How old was I? 19. Yeah, I was 42. And, uh, where did you live when you came back then? You were not didn't go back to the black and whites? Um, no, we had moved from the black oh. and whites uh, previous to that and had lived... Before you went to Champaign? Oh, yes. Okay. We owned a house in West Lafayette on Connolly Street. And uh, we had rented that house to a visiting professor uh, during that period of time. So we simply reoccupied that house when we came back. Um, so that was not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, well, at least the department was very gracious and uh, very cooperative. And the man who uh, everybody thought was going to be department head, uh, he had to swallow pretty hard. 
and he was his name was H.O. Day. He was a wonderful teacher, a very brilliant fellow, and uh, he was just, uh, uh, my feeling was that he was too close to retirement, to, and they decided that it would be better to start with a young person. All right. Allows but, for growth. The growth within. So uh, uh, we started our, started a new uh, new day in the department. J.J. Uh, Davis gave me a ring of keys, and he went in, in his little office, and I went in mine, and we went we were on off from and there. running. Right. We were okay. off and running. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful challenge. Uh, I was able to uh, uh, hire some excellent staff. And my philosophy about uh, building a department is you you hire the person and then find the right things for him to do. Uh, true, we hired some people to do particular things, but my goal was always to hire the right man and then work things around. Uh, and as a consequence, we uh, built a pretty good department mm -hmm. over the course of the years. Right. Uh, we went from the uh, initial eight to over a hundred people in the course of my tenure as department head, and uh, I just couldn't have asked for better cooperation from the university. Uh, Fred Hubdies was president, of course, at the time, and uh, uh, he uh, he his philosophy was you you give a person the opportunity and he builds it himself. If he fails, he fails. If he succeeds, he succeeds. And uh, the university had a mission. Uh, I, I recognized that when I first came here, that Purdue was unusual in that regard. Uh, it, was, it was at a time when the students were flocking in here. They had doubled the uh, enrollment. This is after World War II? Right after World War II, you see, immediately sure. after World War II. And there were 15, 000, about 15,000 students here when I came. And only two years before, there had been only about 7,000. So uh, it was... Big leap. It was a big leap for it, and they were bursting at the seams. Um, but everybody is cooperative, and uh, the land-grant philosophy, and I grew up with the land-grant philosophy because of where my parents, my dad worked, uh, there was it wasn't any question, but Purdue knew where it was going, uh, and that impressed me greatly. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, not about that. What happened to the black and whites? Did they get? They were, uh, how long and approximately? Well, <laughs> well, the black and whites. They were along lasted, State Street. They are all along State Street. Okay. From Fowler, from across from the Fowler House, that's where we went for in case there was a tornado. Okay. The Fowler House. All the way up to Airport Road. Okay. That clarifies in semicircles, uh, in half circles, in that little half circles, little courts, and uh, they lasted. Uh, well, they began to take them down at the far end because they wanted to. They needed to build uh, uh, accommodations for married students who were coming in by the hundreds. Uh, there were still some left after about uh, six years, but they took them down pretty fast once they decided to take them down. Okay. Okay. And there was a lot of regret. There were people that didn't want to move. Uh, it was surprising. It, it just uh, the university was uh, just couldn't believe how much the people enjoyed living in the in the black and whites. Mm -hmm. Marvelous. Yeah. yeah. Well, that part of it, from what you said earlier, the camaraderie you got to know, and there was a, it was like your little conclave. Absolutely. Way. All right, and that make that makes it nice. Oh yes, yeah. right. It was a, it was ideal. Right. Uh, a lot was going on at Purdue in those early days, and uh, in carrying out its mission, uh, land grant mission. Uh, Purdue was willing to change, and I think some universities didn't catch on to that. They were willing to change, and they had the people on the faculty who could make it change. Uh, Stuart, uh, R.B. Stewart, who was the business manager of the university, was the pioneer financier of Purdue University. And as a matter of fact, he set the pace for the entire nation in terms of developing uh, independent financing 
of university developments. And uh, uh, Hovde had, put, had a very good starting team. He, he had Hakama, uh, who, who was uh, vice president for faculty affairs, R.B. Stewart, and uh, then he had E.C. Young, who became uh, vice president and dean of the grad school. And uh, I got to know E.C. Young very well before I went to uh, Illinois, and I found out later he was one of those who had insisted that I move on and get my Ph.D., uh, which is kind of interesting. Right. Uh, but Hubby had a great basic team, and uh, uh, he used it skillfully. Uh, I consider him an outstanding president. Uh, change was perhaps the key word at the time, and Purdue did not fear change. They welcomed change. And uh, that was the key to the early successes in the building of right. uh, the new Purdue University. In your, in your department, did, uh, you, did your course continue on, the program that you started? Uh, yes. Uh, when I came back, one of the first hire I made I think it was the first hire I made as department head was to find a replacement for the urban program. And we hired a fellow by the name of William Butts, B-U-T-T-S, who uh, stayed with us 10 years, was a marvelous teacher, developed, developed, took the program a step higher than am I. Uh, my philosophy was that you hire somebody who's, who's better than the department head, who knows more than the department head and then you let them go right. with a little guidance. Right, right. And uh, that's how good it worked out. Good philosophy, that's good, right. Um, tell us a little, do you want to talk a little bit about your, the, your pesticide and the programs and things or research areas, anything of that sort? Any comment on that? What was uh, funding, how was, how was it funding, getting funding for some of these programs at the, during those days, was it difficult? Well, <laughs> uh, it's different today. It's much different today. Sure. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a department head today. And there are too many restrictions, too much government uh, dominance. Uh, in those days, uh, there wasn't a lot of money, but the dean knew how to allocate okay. the money. Okay. And uh, What about money we from could the get grants? From the federal agencies, USDA, could you get some? Event oh, well, we had a lot of USDA money. Okay. And then eventually... We began to get uh, uh, National Science Foundation money, National Institute of Health money, and okay. so forth and so on. The large and, and, large, and there was a fair amount of industry money that came in, uh, especially in the development of pesticides. Uh, so although fi finances were slim, uh, we were able to allocate them. Okay. And you, you tried to encourage your staff to go out and get grants, and and they did so. I mean, if if their line of work uh, warranted that type of grants. Uh, bear in mind that the land-grant philosophy uh, stressed that agriculture was a practical uh, vocation that needed to be undergirded with research and instruction and extension. Right. Um, a marvelous thing. Um, what about the uh, the extension service was already there, but you were involved in that to some extent afterwards, weren't well, you? Well, uh, when yeah. I was department head, I was a one third extension. Okay. Um, did that involve? Did you go around the state to do some travel with connection with that? Oh, I did a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. I, tra as a matter of fact, when I was department head, uh, I was away too much of the time, really, not just in the state but all over the country, um, and. Uh, It, um, Purdue is very, uh, very liberal about uh, allowing staff to travel and to give talks all over the country sure. and things of that sort, which I did. Mm -hmm. uh, the pesticide, you, you've brought up the pesticide question several times, mm -hmm. and um, pesticides simply were uh, the necessity of the day. Uh, when I came to Purdue, it was the, it was the DDT, the beginning of the DDT era, and the chlorinated hydrocarbons 
that, uh, that came out of it, chlordane dealer and things of that sort, and the organophosphates, and then the carbamates. So it was a progression of development uh, of pesticides, and the experiment stations were expected to test these products from the standpoint of agriculture, and of course they were tested, we tested a lot of it from the standpoint of the urban community also. Um, the pivotal, pivotal time in the pesticide usage uh, was in 1962 uh, when Rachel Carson wrote her book The Silent Spring. Uh, most people know about Rachel Carson, so I don't need to elaborate on her, except to say when her book came out, it came out as three installments in the New Yorker magazine. And uh, I was at a meeting after the first installment came out and was trying to explain, this was an extension meeting, uh, a, a North Central Region extension meeting. And uh, I tried to explain that uh, what this lady's writings were all about although we didn't really believe half of what she was saying. Nevertheless, she seemed to have a, a point that would catch on with the public, and uh, it did. It was, uh, it was accepted spontaneously. Uh, but at any rate, at that meeting, that extension meeting, extension direct, one extension director got up, and he said, Osmond, you're wasting your breath telling about this. There is nothing ever published in the New Yorker magazine that will ever have any impact on the extension service. And he sat down and thought that I ought to sit down. <laughs> Little did they realize the spin-off from that book. Uh, it was difficult to swallow for a while, and, uh, but we began to realize that she had a very fundamental premise upon which she built it, and that was that the environment was a sacred thing that we must take care of. And she simply used pesticides as an example uh, of the uh, fact that uh, uh, the contaminants in our so-called contaminants in our environment were jeopardizing our lives in our environment. So it was a plus, as it turned out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, at any rate, uh, By uh, 1970, it was obvious that the federal government <clears throat> was going to uh, do something drastic with respect to environmental situations. And uh, under Nixon, they put together uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, in 1972, uh, I stepped aside from being department head. Uh, I'd been part, department head long enough. Prior to my time, department head stayed until they retired or died. I, I didn't believe in that philosophy. Uh, I spent 16 years as department head. It was time for somebody else to take over, and, and a new thrust. So um, I went on sabbatical and uh, went to Washington to work for USDA went to Australia for some background in termites, which was my specialty, and then came back and uh, had the opportunity uh, of joining the Environmental Protection Agency. And I became director of the operations division of the agency that dealt with the, the pesticides, all the registration, the outreach, the development of uh, certification and so forth. And uh, very briefly, my role at EPA was to head up a group that would develop the uh, certification standards for people who were, apply, were to apply pesticides from the farmer to all types of commercial people. Uh, we set the standards and uh, developed them, the standards for certification and the standards for training undergirding certification. And if I contributed anything in my lifetime of significance, I think it was getting that thing done uh, with the help of some two or three very good guys. 
Um, That's a big challenge. It was, but but I was fortunate. Uh, there was one person by the name of James White, who was there in EPA when I joined. He'd been with USDA. He knew something about pesticides in terms of uh, he had contacts with people in the states, and that was great. So I had him, and then I brought in a man by the name of Dr. Fred Whittemore, who was with the uh, for, uh, FAO at the time, and uh, he wanted to come back to the States. He was in Italy. He was an outstanding scientist in his own rights, and he was my deputy in, at, at EPA. So the three of us really put together the standards that are in use in every county in the United States today. Wonderful. Uh, so it's one little thing that I'm kind of proud about. Yeah, very well. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, let's get back to Purdue. I, yes, please do. Uh, one thing I was going to, uh, how did that relate to your appointment at Purdue with EPA? Were you on leave or? I was on leave and then oh. I was on extended leave. I see, okay. Because yeah. you were still with Purdue, but you were with the EPA for I, several years. I was I was a Purdue faculty member on leave. Okay. And I came back at, I was carried on the staff, and so I simply came back right. after two, almost three years of being yeah. away. I understand. Okay. They were very generous in letting me extend my leave of absence. Okay. So when I came back, uh, each state had to develop its own pesticide program, so they made me, uh, uh, I was uh, in charge of the pesticide programs at Purdue. And we put that together. That was an interesting program. So that continued on. That was my job, really, until retirement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, had you been thinking about retiring? or I Did you re- have the option to I go have reti- time? I haven't retired I yet. Mean, we never retire. <laughs> As I say to somebody, you know, people are always busy, but I say when things settle, when things settle down, I get nervous. That stops them right there. <laughs> yeah. The only change in my daily life was that I wasn't being paid by Purdue. But I still went back to Purdue very frequently mm. for many, many years. <laughs> mm. What year did you retire in? Um, 80, 1987. Oh. Yeah. Not so long ago. Yeah. That's can we ask you, uh, do you want to make a comment on that report that you did for the, on the Osmond report? That's oh, yeah. Um, and then you can, you've got some notes. I'll let you take it from there. And you know, we're going to mention, did you want to say anything about Inverse, that national pesticide information? No, no, I've okay. said that. Okay, about that. okay. Uh, NPIRS. Is that still going? N- NPIRS, is that still going, the national? NPIRS? Yeah. Oh, NPIRS. Yeah. NPIRS was something else. Um, That's what I meant, NPIRS. I, I mispronounced oh, it. Right. Um, that was a national pesticide, pesticide information, information retrieval, retrieval system. Right. Um, Purdue was a, a leader, especially the School of Agriculture, in developing the use, the practical use of computers. And um, we had several very competent people on the faculty uh, one of them was a fellow by the name of Dick Collier, who was over in biochemistry in the state chemist's office. And <clears throat> he was a very good computer. He was a computer shark. And he was compiling information on pesticides for the state chemist. And um, it appeared that it would be very helpful if we had a national program a centralized program for the retrieval of pesticide information. So he and I worked cooperatively with the U.S. DA in Washington, and they wanted to have such a thing. And uh, uh, Dick worked on the computer side of the thing, and I worked on the arrangements to convince Washington that they should put it at Purdue University. There were several other universities that wanted it. Uh, so it worked out that it, it came here, and uh, it served a very useful right. purpose. Right. In fact, it's still in existence. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one of the lasting things that got done. Sure. Um, there are a couple of things back in the, my days as a faculty member at Purdue that I would like to mention. Please. 
Um, the funny little things, perhaps, but they, to me, they were, they were interesting. Uh, I was on the, the university senate, which originally uh, uh, it was called. Uh, uh, Executive the, Council. Huh? Executive Ex Council, for a number of years, and then they reorganized it and became the university senate. And uh, I was on it a couple of times, and uh, in the sixties. I chaired the uh, uh, Campus Affairs Committee, I believe it was called that, that's close. And one of the things that we considered in 1968-69 uh, was that it was the anniversary uh, of the founding of Purdue, and uh, that's it was decided that we needed a new seal at Purdue. And my committee was given the job of working up the new seal, which I used to have one around here somewhere. Uh, but at any rate, uh, we worked with a fellow, that, I was chair of that committee, and we worked with a fellow by the name of Al Go Gowen. And uh, uh, he was a over in uh, applied art, and he was a good designer. And we wanted to somehow preserve what was the university seal at the time. Not formally; it was never had, had never been endorsed by the by the board of trustees. Uh, but we wanted to, to, to a new version of it. So we worked with him, and. Uh, he came up with a final design for the seal, which is now the un officially the university seal. It was used for everything for many years. Uh, uh, it changed its appearance uh, in, in Al's design, but the intent was still there, in that the uh, it had the griffin in the center of it, and uh, that symbolized strength, and then it had going off from it uh, three major divisions, kind of a shield, uh, which originally were science, technology, and, and agriculture. Uh, but I think they, uh, we changed it to be education, research, and service. But the seal almost didn't get accepted. And I'll tell you, that, that was my, my other part in it. <laughs> Um, Al was supposed to bring the seal and present it to the the faculty through the Senate. And we had slides made, and he had a story he was going to tell about the development of it. The, the day that he was supposed to arrive, he did not arrive at the Senate meeting. And there were people on the Senate that didn't want to change it anyway. Why would we need a new seal? So there we were. They were all assembled to see all this, these slides. Al didn't show up. So since I was chairman of the committee, I had to present the proposed new seal. And that was quite an argument. But in the end that day, they decided, okay, go ahead and do it. And uh, then it was sent on to the Board of Trustees who adopted it as their, as their seal. Uh, the other little thing on the Senate that I have to tell you about was why we have garages at Purdue. Um, parking in the 60s was, became a major, major problem. You know, in the early days when I came here, uh, the trolley tracks were just being taken up on State Street. And we parked on State Street. That was where we parked out in front of our buildings. So a vast change took place in terms of automobiles at Purdue. <laughs> And it was getting so something had to be done. So the proposal uh, from the administration was that we build garages. Well, in order to build garages, there had to be money raised. And one of the sources of money would be that the people using the garage would have to pay to use it. And all the faculty that wanted a, a permit to park on the campus anywhere uh, would have to cough up money. 
and that would pay for the garages. The senators did not like that. And we came to an impasse one day in, in, in arguing about it in the Senate. And I got sick of listening to it, so I got up and made a motion that indeed we uh, proceed forward with uh, building garages at Purdue University. Well, it passed by one vote. And uh, uh, then I was given the charge of taking it before the faculty. And we met in the, in the assembly room over in Double E Building and there was a huge turnout for the faculty because they knew this whole problem was coming up. So I had to present my motion that I had made and explain why to the faculty. And after some debate, they decided, well, I guess we have to do it. Got to do it. Got to do it. So we started building garages. It's <laughs> so, a good story. Huh? That's a good yeah, story. Yeah, I, I was fortunate in yes. being at the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, the one thing I do want to talk about Go ahead. Uh, was the 1960s, which is the era of student discontent. And the, the, the students wished to ch ch challenge the authority of, sta of uh, the executive authority of the university. And this was going on all over the country, as is probably well known. And uh, they, they, they challenged the administration at every turn. Uh, by 1970, uh, 1968, by 1968, uh, that had become an important matter at Purdue. Uh, one of the first things that happened uh, was that the, uh, the black students rebelled. And I remember the day when about 60 of them lined up in a straight line in front of the Hubdi Hall, each with a brick in his hand. And we didn't know whether they were going to throw the bricks or what they were going to do. But as it turned out, that the, the state police were called and they came in and for several hours it was very tense. But really their intent was simply to get recognition of the black community at Purdue. And uh, the bricks were to build, they said, at the time after they cooled off a little, they were simply going to be for the foundation of uh, uh, doing something for the black community. But nevertheless, that was a protest and a, an outward evidence of protest. But simultaneous with this was the fact that our exponent, the student newspaper, uh, was pretty much did what it wanted to do in those days. Uh, and a young fellow by the name of William Schmoot uh, was, became editor. Uh, in the summer of 1948, uh, before the fall semester of 48, he appeared before the Rotary Club at, uh, in Lafayette and gave a very derogatory, insulting picture of what student life was at Purdue and the terrible relationship between students and the faculty and the administration. And uh, it shook people up. But nothing really came out of it immediately until uh, they overstepped their bounds and started publishing uh, four-letter words in the exponent. Uh, President Hovde is a pretty patient person. Uh, but when a, a particularly obnoxious a poem appeared in the Exponent one day, uh, written and deriding President Hovde, uh, his administration said, you've got to shut that Exponent down. So he tried to do that. He, he said uh, he fired Schmoot, who was a student editor, and shut the, wanted to shut the exponent down. Uh, technically, he couldn't do that because Schmoot was a student and the exponent staff was a student club activity. And it was technically independent of, of, the, of the 
faculty in the administration. There was a student activity, you know. He couldn't do that, but he did. And uh, that started a big furor. And uh, uh, at the time, uh, John Hicks, and I've got to deviate here just a little bit. Uh, John Hicks was the executive assistant to President Hubdy. John Hicks and I went to college together back in Massachusetts. Uh, I want to talk about John Hicks, uh, because John Hicks and I were in college together back at uh, Massachusetts State College. Uh, I was a senior when he was a freshman, and the seniors in general uh, didn't know very many freshmen, but we knew John Hicks. Uh, he was an unusual person, and uh, he had his head on his shoulders. He was a very informal person. He came to college with a in a sweatshirt with a New York Giants baseball cap. So he was an, an individual from day one, and that's why we knew him. But we soon realized that he uh, was quite a, a fine young man and uh, had great promise. So when he showed up here at Purdue, well, actually, he came to Purdue uh, the year before I did. Uh, he came to Purdue uh, maybe two years before I did, I guess, as a grad student. And when I came here, uh, he was one of the first people to come and greet me at Purdue. Uh, so uh, John was everybody's friend, but he in particular was a good friend of mine because of our former association. When the exponent situation developed, and John was then executive assistant to uh, President Hovde, um he came to me and said, uh, uh, the president's going to form a, a committee. Uh, he doesn't know quite what the composition of it's going to be, but his way of handling the exponent situation was to ha form a committee of faculty and students. And uh, John says, I think you ought to be chairman of it. I said, I don't know anything about it, you know. Uh, he said, I think you ought to be chairman of it. So he uh, told the president that he that I should be chairman of it. The president had me come in. We sat down and talked at length about how to go at this thing. I sat in his office while he picked up the phone and put this committee together. It would be half faculty and half students. And I think there were a total of us of uh, 10 people. And uh, so we formed, the committee was formed. Uh, wonderful students. She, they were just outstanding kids. And uh, we met uh, frequently as a committee to try to iron out the, the problem. And the difficulty was that Fred Hubdy, feeling that the president of the university should take action, uh, had bypassed due process. He didn't mean to, but he did. He bypassed due process. And he, he legally, even though it was determined eventually that the exponent was owned by the university, the organization of it as a student organization uh, was something that he just couldn't close down. You just didn't do that to student activities. So we debated this thing, called in. We had a, a very fine uh, attorney who was on the staff at the University of Michigan who was expert in... Uh, in uh, publications, and uh, we had him on as a, as a consultant. Uh, we brought in people from all walks of life to discuss this matter. Uh, and it, it, it personally uh, was a marvelous challenge, and uh, I essentially dropped being a department head for a year. Uh, Dean Coles wasn't exactly keen on that originally, initially. Uh, but nevertheless, that's how Fred Hovde wanted it done. And uh, I almost lived the life of a student at the time. I'd stay up all night with the exponent staff, 
that was that took over and in Swoop's absence because he didn't come back. Uh, he he could have been reinstated, uh, but he didn't. He wasn't really reinstated. Uh, but it was a it was a challenge, and it uh, it gave me an insight as to why the students protested. They protested status quo, and they it was a new era. The Vietnam War had completely changed the attitude of people in the United States, and the university was thought of as simply a uh, organization run by some president and his executive group, and the students didn't like it. So they rebelled. Uh, I think we were lucky at Purdue, even though we had some uh, pretty rough times at Purdue with a sit-in, the sleep-in yeah. in the union building and a, uh, one attempt to burn an office and so forth. Uh, uh, we were fortunate. We got out of it pretty good. Well, But I think that the business of having the study of the exponent continuing on over a period of half the year, half of that year, and then on into the next year, uh, kind of kept things cool. We didn't have a lot of sputtering from the newspaper. Uh, they were very cooperative about it. They dropped their four-letter words, and uh, they became a responsible newspaper. And that was part of what a newspaper should be. It's responsible to its readership. Right. It had not been responsible to its readership under Schmoot. And once that got turned around, and we finally ended up recommending that the exponent be an independent, uh, be in, in, independent and not owned by the university, um, but the students could still carry it on as a student activity, uh, things smoothed out. And um, I always felt that that particular opportunity for that year of 48, 49, uh, helped settle the, uh, the campus down and we didn't go off in wild tangents like right. so many people did right. and many places did right. so I guess that's all I wanted to say okay. about the exponent oh. other than to say that uh, uh, Mr. Canoy who was the chairman of the uh, pre president of the uh, board of uh, trustees the, uh, board of trustees was an extremely cooperative person he and I met frequently. He and I really we became pretty good friends, and uh, it led to some nice things afterwards, like uh, being elected to the Iron Key, which is a senior honorary society. That was a that was an honor. So those were good times, mm -hmm. and they were bad times, but good times. Right. Okay. But I, I want to say this that Fred Hovde was wonderful through this whole thing. He could have uh, been very difficult, but he was not at all. We would call him and he would meet with us from time to time. And uh, in the long run, we had to rule against him in our report, which is a very difficult thing to do. And to get this committee that I chaired unanimous in how that was worded in our report took a lot of personal negotiation. And uh, Fred Hubdi just took this thing perfectly. He was just a gentleman about it all, understood it, changed his ways, okay. and uh, we were very fortunate. And we move forward. Move on. Right. That was his philosophy. You move on. Right. Good. Yeah. Okay, any other couple of things that you want to say? And then also tell me about an outstanding event. You've got some other notes that you want to share with us? Oh, I could talk a long time, uh, I, but we I may won't. have to do another part. <laughs> I won't. I, I would simply say that okay. moving from president to president at Purdue uh, was quite an experience in itself. Uh, Arthur Hansen came in at a difficult time. It was the end of the Vietnam War, and uh, everything was tense on the campus. And he was exceptionally good at working with the students. And uh, he turned the attitude of the campus over, uh, turned it around to a favorable atmosphere. I give him a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. I didn't know President Beering so well. Um, I got to know 
President Jiski better, actually. You're sitting on a chair right now that was given to me by uh, that chair is uh, when I was awarded a, a, a professorship in my name here at Purdue, uh, an endowed professorship, and that's the chair they gave me in the at, at, out at uh, Westwood, and, and at the Jiskies, and that was a very fine occasion. Was it, how did they approach you on that? Did, was it a surprise? Um, no, uh, no, because there had been a drive going on. The thing about that chair is that there had been a drive going on in the, through the Department of Entomology and Ag Development, School of Agriculture to Ag Development, to raise money for a uh, endowed professorship in entomology. And um, so it had been going on for some time. And so the decision was made somewhere along the way that uh, they would make this, uh, they'd make it the John Osmond endowed chair. Uh, I was very fortunate. That's very nice. Oh, great honor. That's very honor. nice. And you could sit in the chair and enjoy the honor. That's exactly, <laughs> you said it. That's exactly <laughs> what I do. Okay. Uh, I've been so lucky at Purdue. It's just been a, it's a great place to, to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's simply because I think Purdue uh, always kept the land grant philosophy in mind. It was always seeking the truth. It was uh, dedicated to the need for change, and adapted itself to change, and brought the right people in to help it happen. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a great university to have been associated with. Any closing comments, or how about an outstanding event? Have you got anything outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? An outstanding event, ben. or were they? They were all outstanding. They were all outstanding. Good. Anything that <laughs> to me. <laughs> any questions that, that I didn't that you'd like to? Any further comments that you think of? Oh, I. In closing, that you'd like to share. Uh, you might want to put on the tape about the upcoming book. That your. No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Uh, we didn't say anything about. Um, the buildings here at Purdue. Okay. Can I have a minute to do Go, that? Go, please do. All right. Um, in, in the 50s, um, President Hovde and R.B. Stewart and, and the rest decided that they just had to have more facilities. Uh, the legislature, the state legislature, would, would only give us so much money and R.B. Stewart figured out a system for bonding. And uh, the, the self-liquidating bond system, which was a pioneering event among universities, opened up the way to build. And the first building that they wanted to build uh, was what was known as uh, Memorial Center, which uh, uh, was going to be a combination of adult education theater, uh, student activities. It was kind of an outreach building. And uh, it also, they wrapped, the, wrapped it around the library, as you well know. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was quite an activity, uh, quite a, a, a thing to go to start to do uh, because they weren't going to get the money for the legislature to do this. Uh, the distressing part was, and it was distressing, uh, the decision to tear down Hevelin Hall and to tear down Fowler Hall. Uh, that was a very difficult thing for the people on the campus and the students and the alumni to understand. We woke up one morning, literally, the day after graduation, one year, in the middle 50s, and there was a wrecking ball knocking down Hevelin Hall. You know, that was the symbol of Purdue University. That was one brick higher. And uh, that was a very difficult thing for everybody to accept. And Fowler Hall coming down, it was a, it was a landmark. Uh, but they did, they came down and the new building started. And you know, in the long run, that was the thing that had to be done. Uh, 
fortunately, the, it, it bothered people for years around I'm here. Sure. And fortunately, under uh, in Beering's time, uh, when he was president, they built the, the new bell tower. And that took the edge off the loss of the of the, of the Heaven Hall Tower. And that's quite and a landmark. The chime, chimes, chimes came back, right. and the campus lightened up. Right. That was a real plus when that happened. Right. Yeah. So I guess that's all I know. Okay. Well, this concludes the interview. We want to thank you very, very much, Dr. Osmond, for this interview. My pleasure. Thank you.